Farming is more than just food. Farming is about a cultural identity. Once upon a time, New Brunswick had farming as core to its cultural identity. You had forestry, fishing, and farming. We continue to talk about forestry and fishing, but farming seems to have faded from the overall conversation. Today's guest, Chris Michaud of Agricultural Alliance New Brunswick, Agricole Nouveau Brunswick, brings us up to speed on what's going on in the farming world, what needs to be done, relations with government, by local campaigns, soil, and much more. At some point in time, for the future of the province, the conversation around farming needs to be an everyday conversation. So thank you for coming and taking the time. My pleasure. Farming is a big deal. Yes. <laughs> and, and it struggles to get the traction it deserves in the provincial narrative, in the political narrative, in the economic narrative. So maybe a starting point for us is explain uh, the role of the Agricultural Alliance and its scale, scope, mandate. Well, the, New Brun the Greek Agricultural Alliance is... Uh it was one of, one of the two uh, provincial organizations that represents farmers along with the, the NFU. Uh, we're there to uh, represent uh, issues that affect uh, all farmers of the province, no matter how big or how small or what commodity that you're into. And uh, I must say that uh, we oftentimes uh, we do our job because issues that that do happen never never come to light so usually if you do a good job you, you, you know it doesn't it doesn't come out so you, you don't get you don't really get heard of so and uh, I must say that uh, speaking of not being in the narrative of the province uh, the last economic plan that the province uh, did come up with uh, agriculture was actually mentioned for once so I think that they're actually starting to see the value of, of agriculture. It's a question when I have the chance to interview political leaders that I'll ask of them um, when they talk about economic development for the province. So there'll be attention to industry, there'll be attention to IT, and then I'll go and farming. And there's sort of an awareness of it, but there's definitely um, no sophistication or complexity to the role that farming could have for New Brunswick's economy or well-being. Not to mention, you know, eating good food is good for you mm -hmm. and that impact. Do you have your own take on the role that farming could have in this province if it was given more attention? Well, I mean, it's uh, there's a lot of rural regions, a lot of land that is going to waste, that is growing up in alders. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a hard answer to say because it's not... I mean, it's not just growing. You need to be able to sell it at the other end and to be able to sell it at a profit. It's not, you know, so it's it's a very complicated issue, but I, I think there is there is definitely potential there. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a piece of that then. Um, how much farmland does New Brunswick have, if, if you know, and then how much is, uh, is not being used? Like, what's the potential for the development of farmland? Well, there's a, I think there's, there's, I could be mistaken, but I do believe that there's about 15% of potential farmland in New Brunswick that's being used right now. If you include like wooded regions that that would have very would have suitable land for agriculture, mm -hmm. so I mean the potential is it's huge. is all is huge. It's just a matter of be, of having the uh, the foresight to to predict where it will go and doing it right. And if there was an economic strategy or development strategy, how long do you think it would take to come to some degree of fruition to start to see the benefit? Well, to uh, to see the full benefit, in my belief, I think it's going to take a generation to change the to start changing the mindset of people. It's not it's certainly not done overnight. <laughs> so in your, there needs to be a whole a whole cultural change of what farming is and what and what it brings to a community and what it brings to rural region and what it brings to the social fabric of, of, a, of a population. Can you explain that one a bit more? I would be great to hear about it. <laughs> because people, uh, some of the business people or the business section of the paper will look at it as a commodity and, and look at return or financial gain. Um, but there's others who know that food and farming is a lot more than just 
that because of the impact in the community? Well, it's it's money that just flows around in the same community. You hire people that go to the local grocery store, and then in turn they they buy from the local gas shop, and you know it's the money tends to go full circle. Mm-hmm. I'm not an economist, no, so... No, but you're... Are you a farmer yourself? Yes, I'm a, actually a fourth-generation farm. Really? Farmer, yep. Where's, and, your, uh, where's your farm? In, uh, in Bucktouche, New Brunswick. We actually are just starting our fifth year as as new owners uh, from my... Bought from my uh, from my father and my uncle, along with uh, two, other, two other partners that are actually first-generation farmers. So, and uh, I say that... We are, we are, our farm has gone through basically every commodity out there from dairy to beef to potatoes to finally finding a, a recipe that seems to work. We, uh, I mean, just our operation alone hires 35, uh, 35 local people. So mm. that, you know, it, it does have an impact yeah. on the local economy. Yeah. How, how big is your farm? We uh, farm 600 acres. Uh, which 150 is in vegetables, 100 in grain, and the rest is in hay and rotation crops. Okay. Now, would that be considered a, a big farm or a small farm? That, for, <laughs> my re- for my region, would be considered a big farm. But in the scheme of things, it's a very small farm. Right. And, and that's part of the conversation people need to start to understand. Agribusiness, we do understand it in New Brunswick through watching McCain's or Irving's through Cavendish. Um, we'll farm at a certain scale. Yeah. Um, most people around here have, have, might not be aware of the scale of farming out west when they're talking 40,000 acres uh, for one farm. You know, that, that's a whole yeah. other scale. So, well, yeah, the average, the average size there is about 3,000 acres, and that's average. Yeah. So there was just to develop the awareness of how complex it's become compared to the story we had maybe about farms a hundred years ago and their impact and role in community it's everything you read about it it's gotten more complex in terms of uh, computers software um, planning um, the business side of it then there's the machinery side of it mm-hmm. um, that's all changed can, can you share a little bit of what that's like for you on the ground running a farm well i mean the, uh, like you said the cost of machinery is is through the roof so it's very uh a farmer today really, really needs to know his cost of production and where he can save and make sure that he does things right. Uh, it's not uh, for me with a hundred acres of grain to go buy a, a three quarters of a million dollar combine. It, it just, it just can't happen. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not, it's not feasible at all. So there's a lot to say about uh, farmers working together in a collaborative way that we can all that we can all advance and not be, you know, we're not, there's no farmer here in the province that should be considered your competitor. The competitor is California. It's, you know, yes. here we're all, we're all in the same boat. And if we work together, we can all, I think it'll be best for, better for all of us. And that's where the alliance comes in? Well, it's, it's part of it. Uh, there's other associations too. Uh, I'm thinking of the, uh, Agricole de Chenu, the really local harvest in in Dieppe, which is, which was built on farmers actually wanting to work together to, to better their all of their own situations. Yeah, and uh, it certainly worked well. Cause I'd say that most members uh, of the really local harvest would say that they're much better off than they were fifteen years ago. So, do you find it? Um Different, by definition, I guess it's different from when you get up in the morning and you put on your work clothes and you go work the farm, or you get up in the morning and you put on your jacket and your dress shirt, <laughs> and you're the, you know, the president of the Agricultural yeah, Alliance. The, the new president. Yeah. I'm still, I'm still learning the ropes. Yeah. But, so what's, are they both equally as valuable at this point in time for farming in New Brunswick? Yeah. Oh yes, yeah. I, every farmer has to do his part, and uh, it's not just staying in your silo and doing your own thing. You have to, you know, you have to get informed. You have to know what's going on, and yeah, I guess because things change so fast, and uh, you have to adapt and and move on and try to make the best of the situation that you're in, mm. and you can't be stuck in a certain 
in a certain way because yeah. everything around you changes so fast. In in that spirit of change, um... I mean, it's uh, climate change for New Brunswick. If you hear if you hear those experts say it, it's. It, it seems like it's can only a good thing because it's going to, you know, advance a, a, a longer season and a chance for different crops. But in saying that, we had the worst drought last summer that we've had in 40 years. So there's still, you know, you still need to adapt to those climate changes. It's not just longer season. It's yeah. it's three weeks of nonstop rain and then two months of <laughs> absolutely no rain. Yeah. So there has to be, you know, some help there for the government to help with maybe drainage and and also having irrigation ponds that you can you know that you can adapt to whether whatever the weather throws your way yeah when it comes to irrigation and water management um studies will show that the largest users of water will be farms and i'm thinking ontario and, and the west right now it might be different from new brunswick and that a lot of that water kind of goes up in evaporation because of the systems that we designed 40, 50 years ago, which means out there, there must be new irrigation systems that are probably quite expensive to put in place, but would be much more efficient in the allocation of water. Well, drip irrigation is would probably be the the, the, the best one I can say right now for, for efficient water, because it's, it is underground and it's, it drips. So, I mean, it's, the plant sucks it up at the, right away and i mean there's times there's better times of the day to irrigate than others too so it's a matter of doing the research and finding out when when is the best time to do it because it's not yeah uh, drip irrigation is not necessarily always feasible for everybody either yeah. uh, depending on the crops you grow and so do you have people helping uh, the farmers with this sort of implementation and new technology and new science to come? Uh, not. <laughs> no? Not to any great extent. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I mean, the government is pretty tight, uh, too. They're, I mean, they do have good, pe very, very good people in the department, mm -hmm. but they can only, I mean, they can only do so much, too. <laughs> yeah, with the resources they yeah. have. I, it was just a thought because... It, it, if the farmers are working together already, and then here's some new technology on drip irrigation that we recognize there's 85% of potential farmland not being used. So if we start to break that new ground with new technology while training new farmers, mm -hmm. does that sound like something that might happen in New Brunswick? Well, uh, it's, it's, it seems like it's underway because uh, the along with the alliance working with the government there is a new entrant roadmap that it's out now that it's out now so it's a very good source of of information for for, for new farmers to you know kind of learn the ropes a little bit uh nothing beats experience of course <laughs> but at least it uh, points them in the right direction hmm. uh it's actually it will be re-launched uh, uh, along with uh a land bank for new uh, for new entrant farmers that should be released in about a month's time or so and it's all going to be on a, on a website it's on pdf right now the 2017 version but it's it's going to go to a website which in that way it can be updated and kept yeah. up to date a lot easier and it's easier to work through so a land bank can you explore that a bit as well as the new entrant Program. Well, it goes along with uh, older farmers that are ready, maybe ready to retire, or and uh, don't necessarily have anybody in the family or anybody that they know that wants to take over. So it kind of a uh, trying to get the two the two together, yeah, to to make a system that works. Uh, oftentimes, the retiring farmer has to make maybe a certain sacrifices. To not you know, it's not uh, if you look at the paper value of the farm and the market value of the farm sometimes oftentimes they don't <laughs> they don't, don't really match add up, so eh? uh, i know in our situation that was certainly the case uh, hmm. you can only pay what the you can only pay what the farm can generate itself to repay the bills so yep so we're, we're focusing now on the uh how to get a farm started and what New Brunswick has in place to start to regenerate our ability to feed ourselves because mm -hmm. we import an awful lot of our yes, own we do. food. Yeah. And so you would think that that would help push the conversation just by itself that we can't feed ourselves so we better start paying attention. Do you have 
thoughts well, on that? Well, I, I think that's like I pre mentioned previously. It's it's not going to happen overnight, and I feel it's going to take just about a, a generation to to switch that feeling, that the mentality over, and it starts with ag in the classrooms, okay. starting to teach kids young the, the value of food. It's not it, now. It's just that food is. People feel it's everywhere, and it, we don't have to worry about it. It's always going to be there. It's it's cheap. It's you know, there's no there's no worries till till something happened and infrastructure yeah. breaks down, and all of a sudden food can't come in anymore. Yeah. So if we play that scenario a little bit and thinking climate change again, um, northeast corner of North America is a safe little place in that picture because we'll have water, we have space, mm -hmm. we've got air that's re decent, you know, compared to what's going to happen in California. So imagine California 20 years from now, assuming things follow the same path and the amount of food they produce for North America. Um, same thing for down um, Texas, down around that area that's changing. Oh, yeah, the predictions are not good for for the U.S. It's yeah. going to turn into a desert is what yeah. they're saying, basically. Does. Yes. So there was a story in 2012 about corn and how uh, drought hit about one-third of the U.S. corn crop. Um, stock market thought it was wonderful because of the shortage it jacked the price up higher than oil. So the stock market thought this was a good thing. But from the farming perspective, it was horrid. And in from food supply and food chain, the, you know, some of it was for domestic or for people, and some of it was for manufacturing and for cattle. And mm -hmm. So it wasn't just one market, but it impacted everyone. So imagine more of that. And then here's a little, you know, New Brunswick's not a big place, but we have all this potential to generate more food. Yeah. And it's not, and it can't, it's not... And don't put your eggs all in one basket. It's not. It's not about all blueberries or all maple syrup or because, yeah. or all cranberries. Because twenty years ago, fifteen years ago, cranberries seemed like it was the, yeah. you know, the new crop. But uh, I mean, for eight years they were they were losing money. Last year they finally were able to make a profit again. Right. But I mean, you can't you can't run a farm on making profit every eight years. <laughs> yeah, and and and. Following your lead, eight years is too short a period of time. We need to be thinking longer term. Mm -hmm. So, do you have thoughts of what we need to do now, or are we doing what we need to do now so that 20 years from now uh, it's starting to show stability that New Brunswick made some good decisions in 2018, and so by 2038? Um, it's starting to show that I, we're stable. I think the, the right mindset is there. It seems the right the might mindset is there. Is it because there's an election coming next, you know, this fall? <laughs> yeah. But it seems like people. I mean, it's it's going to be driven by pop by the people in general, by the population. That's they're the ones that really have the power. So it's going to have to start with the grassroots and people starting to value what it means and mm. starting to see the value in having farms around because mm. uh, it's uh with dealing with government you have to have patience <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not uh i wish i had better answers for you but no these are great answers because it maps out where we are today um and then that can give fodder for discussion for moving forward about what we need to focus on first so Part of the solution you had offered was in the school system, starting to have more of that. And there was a big supplement recently in, mm -hmm. the, in the paper about agriculture today and tech advances. And then they had some stories about food in the school. So we're starting to get that connected again. Is that enough? Or it's a, it's or a very it's a very good start because pe but people buying the food have the power. Hmm. So if you can start teaching kids young enough how valuable it is that it that you know it's important <laughs> that we can a region can feed itself if something happens hmm. the more it's ingrained and the more they realize how important it is well they'll probably be willing to pay a little more and put more value in it which will you know and may and be more eager to maybe work for a farm because they know they'll have that satisfaction in knowing that they're they're feeding their family, their communities. Yeah. So, you know, try to change that mindset a little bit. Because, uh, I mean, even with dealing with the, with the groceries chains like we do, we do direct and 
dealing with the grocery stores and I mean uh, seems everything seems to be going up but the the wholesalers want to keep paying you less <laughs> so it seems like the farmer is always the one that has to take the loss yes yes you know, everything's going up so we have to pay you less now well everything's going up for us too yeah. <laughs> you know yeah and that's an important point because people don't get to hear that side of the story very much about what it's like on the farmer side or why government needs to create grants and subsidies much like they do for industry much like they do for the IT sector um, <clears throat> so the the business side of it and getting your your work your produce to market um, some people will map out that the, the big grocery stores um, make their buying decisions in Toronto or or not in New Brunswick so finding local shelf space for local produce when you walk into the big food chain, you, you need to really look for it to see if it's even there. But it, it, it is changing. It is getting better. But that's because people are asking for it. Okay. Good. So then that leaves the timing problem of knowing that you've got that shelf space and a rough idea of how many rows of whatever piece of produce that you create will be sold to plant it in advance knowing it's going to get yeah. to market. Well, that's the thing. You have to look from year to year and figure out, well, I sold this much next year. Did it go well? So mm. should I run out? Should I plant a little more? Did I have too much? Should I plant a little less? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not an easy game to be in. That's for sure. And for somebody new, like I said, it's not, they, they all, oftentimes they'll say grow and it's all, but, you know, they forget that you, once it's grown, you need to sell it. And you need to be able to sell it as a profit. Yep. There was a lovely little movie I got to watch once called How to Grow a Farmer. Yes. And in it, they followed five storylines, I think. And one of them, the lady who had a um, sort of a hobby farm, five or seven acres, I think. But she made this lovely point about growing potatoes. And that um, when you practice guitar or piano, um, you can practice every day. And it goes great. And in my lifetime, I've got 30 chances to grow this potato because one turn is like a whole season. Yep. And if I mess up on something, I got to wait till next year before I do it again. So fascinating to shift the perspective of time or the impact of time on getting it right this time. So then you can turn a small profit to then keep in business and keep going. Yeah, that's a, and that's a big selling point for being diversified. So, you know, if something happens to one crop, well, you got other crops that you can fall into. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, there's much less monoculture now. Most people do, most farmers do farm better, I would mm -hmm. dare, than they did 30 years ago with new, with new, you know, new knowledge, new technologies. Uh, yeah. New research that comes out that's telling us, you know, uh, the soil, soil now is considered a, as much a living thing as anything else not a stale <laughs> not a stale growth environment where you need to put stuff in to make stuff grow it's it's its own life yes and you have to take care of it yeah the the science and the nurturing of soil right that's not part of the narrative either no but. no i mean people people <laughs> do doctorates on on just soil, soil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um this might seem an odd question but it's a classic new brunswick question um are there a lot of similarities between Anglophone farmers and Francophone farmers or in within the region, um, the way Anglophones might approach farming and Francophones? I, I mean I, it in a good way. I don't you know? see a difference in our farming philosophy between Francophones and English. Good. So it's uh, one of those things that unite us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. because I mean the really local harvest is is half and half and yep. it's the language has never even, never <laughs> even been in the narrative. Like, it's never been an issue at all. So that's another thing farming could teach us. Yeah. I mean, to we're, all, uh, we're all in the same boat. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even, even conventional and organic farmers, we actually have more in common than people might realize. <laughs> <laughs> Such as? Well, we're all, we're all trying to make a living off of the soil, yeah. and we're all trying to do the best, the best that we can with the... Uh, with the tools that we have and the situation that we're in. Organic farming in New Brunswick, is it uh, growing? Is it stable? Um, uh, does it have more potential? I'd, I would say it's 
table growing a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people, uh, when you ask the question, will say, oh, yes, for sure. But when it comes to take the wallet out, Fascinating, it changes. Eh? Yeah. So, so maybe there's a whole lesson to be had there. Or oh, heaven forbid we do another promotion campaign or another education program because we get them from so many directions now. Um, but for people that have a circular understanding of the economy instead of the linear one, you were talking about it earlier. Well, the farmer hires this many people and then they buy from local. And it very much was a circular pattern. It stayed within a certain area. Mm -hmm. So that spending of the 5 to 10% more on an organic or a locally grown will actually have a much larger multiplier effect in the community. Yeah, that's where I have a problem. Is it better to buy a local product that's fresh, that was grown, doing the best practices? Yeah. Or buying a, a, a USDA organic that comes from California. Yes. That has that <laughs> has burnt probably, I don't know how much fuel and left a big carbon footprint to get here. Yeah. Is it better? I don't think so. That, that brings up an interesting point because in the news right now, there's a lot of talk about um, <coughs> carbon strategies and carbon pricing and taxing as the federal liberals try to roll out their, their new strategy. Yeah. For some reason, the issue of food, which is the one item that moves the most, never comes up in that conversation. So what would the impact be, in your view, of a carbon footprint sticker price now impacting your ability to buy your groceries? Well, as most farmers would feel that, uh, most farmers that do it right would feel that we're actually carbon negative. <laughs> So, I mean, where, where does it affect us? If it's, and if it's done right and, incur and it encourages farmers to do it right, it, it might not necessarily be a bad thing. If, you, if, if your farm is in hay or rotation crop and you actually get credited for it, I mean, it'll encourage yeah. better practices. But if you get taxed no matter what, what's the incentive? Yeah, but, but there's an interesting ad campaign for the Agricultural Alliance that the, the carbon footprint when you buy local compared to California. Oh, it's, <laughs> yeah, there's a big difference. Yeah, so maybe for the consumer, don't just think about um, the cost when you buy the, the bag of potatoes or the broccoli. Yeah, think about the footprint. Yep. And and I mean, as farmers, we have to do a better sell, a better job of, of promoting ourselves too. Yeah, but that just adds another layer to your workload. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, uh, for the longest time, uh, we do we have no entr new no new entrance, but farmers were keep kept complaining and saying to their kids, "Don't find a better job, because this is this is not a way to make a living." And then why don't we have any new entrance? Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I always tell my father, "You're just you're just lucky. I I didn't really listen to you all those years, because I might be doing something else." <laughs> And, and actually, um, that'll touch another theme. Um, so you stayed here when you did, did. So one of the narratives in New Brunswick is young people always move away. But every province could say that yeah. because oh, yeah. that's what young people do. So did you ever go through that phase and then you come back to run the family farm? No, no, I actually regret not going away. But uh, at the time, uh, my father didn't really want me to go because he, he kept saying, I just, I can't. You have to stay. I'm. Not, I don't know what I'll do if you don't. Yeah. If you don't stay, so it's uh, me being having maybe too big of a heart. I never <laughs> really <laughs> left, and I just kind of yeah. stayed. But yeah. you know, I always uh, still considered myself to have a quality of life, and mm -hmm. never always have some regrets, but never felt bitter about it, or you know, mm -hmm. I, uh, it was just just the way it went. It's just the way it unfolds. Yeah. And and in some ways, it's. Maybe it's a storyline that hasn't been told enough um, about passing things on through generations. I'm thinking of how important food is and how important farming is and how important it would be then for people like you to say, yes, I will take on this responsibility and, and help continue the, the farming tradition in my family. That's, a, that's like a noble profession as well as doing the work it, it is a very satisfying for me it's always i always felt it very satisfying to say that my job is feeding people that's that's what i do for a living i feed people so i mean yeah i mean people forget that uh, if it wasn't if it weren't for farmers we'd still be hunter-gatherers yes i mean it's the backbone of civilization if yep 
We yep. still be hunter gatherers. Yep. That's where it all started to change when we started to stay in one the, place. Yeah, when that first woman figured out that saving the seeds and planting them again, that that they could actually, you know, have a some kind of sustenance and not being uh, not having to chase for food around all the time. Yeah, that's important. I want to play a bit with the issue of scale. Um, McCain Industries, um, or kind of the icon for that part of New Brunswick up around Heartland and such, and that kind of farming. Is there more room for a much larger scale farming in New Brunswick? And what would it take maybe to, to make that happen? Or is our future more in the medium and small scale farming? I think it's both. It's both. I mean, po world populations are continuing to expand. They're going to need to eat. Uh, other Europe, they're going to start running out of room. I mean, their populations are expanding too. They're going to need to have to feed more people. They they only have somewhat a, a, fin, a finite land base. Like there, yep. there's only it it keeps shrinking because I mean there's there's just so many people. So that's yep. where you know us with having so much woodland and crown land that could be suitable for agriculture. We need to we need to think of think ahead and you know find right markets that we can fit in. I always yeah. f figure, you know, start find the market first, then then grow it. Don't don't grow first and then try and to then sell it. Try to sell it. Yes, that's a good point. So and it, it's not it's it's not easy. I don't really I I really don't have an answer. It's it's a non, it's kind of a moving target too. So it's, you know, you have to, yeah. It's if I was an economist or a smarter guy, I might have the answer, but <laughs> yeah, well, but that's where the teamwork comes into yeah. play that somebody that knows where those potentials are slightly different, maybe in perspective than the cranberries, uh, approach, um, which, you know, you said after eight years, it, it lost itself or it lost its market or well, no, after eight years, they finally, finally made, made a profit. profit last year. So wow. Imagine an IT company going that long with with not making a profit. That would be a, a or any industry trying to get there that yeah, way. Yeah, we seem to be the only one that can get seem to stand not making money for so many years and still keep at it. Yep, because because it's foundational. It, without food, we don't go anywhere. So, in that spirit of of development, maybe or um, more of that nurturing our identity is forestry, fishing, and farming, because that used to be New Brunswick's identity. Those three things, but also attention to global pressures. So there are several stories in the media from time to time about foreign countries coming in and buying large pieces of Canadian farmland because they don't have the resources at home to grow. And they the want to make sure that they can feed themselves. Yes. <laughs> So they're starting to realize how important it is. Yeah. So is, and to your awareness, has any of that come to find New Brunswick yet, where foreign countries or large corporations want to come in? Uh, I know that the Ontario Teachers Fund is, is, is buying whole pieces of land in northern New Brunswick as, as an investment. And then pe pe farmers that want to farm that land have to rent from that, from that fund to, to be able to farm it. Okay. And they, uh, they certainly have more more money than to buy that piece <laughs> of land than a lot of local farmers can. Yeah. So it's not necessarily bad if you're a new farmer and you can't really afford land and you can actually rent it and farm it. But how much investment are you going to put in that land that's not yours? Yes. There, in doing some of the homework for the show, that was one of the pieces that came up. Um, and actually, could I read a chunk? And yes, we'll see absolutely. If that fits. Over the past 50 years, farmland has risen in value by 7% a year on average, says Ms. Faulkner. This is a story, an investment story, called The Wealthy Plow Cash into Farmland. And it's from the Globe and Mail in September of 2017. So over the past 50 years, farmland has risen by 7% in value on average. Um, who co And this lady co-founded Area One Farms with her brother, Benji Faulkner in 2012. Area One Farms uses a partnership model in which investors and farmers both put up money to acquire properties in which they will be co-owners. At the end of 10 years, the properties are sold ideally to the farmers, investors are paid out, and the funds are all wrapped up. Is that sort of what the Ontario Pension Fund has done? In no, they're just that the way they're set up, that, that land will never go back to farmers. They, okay. They've bought it as a retirement. 
to fund your retirement fund. Okay. Basically, it's it's an investment to that to, to bring money in. Okay. So the Ontario Pension Fund owns chunks of farmland in New Brunswick. Yep, northern New Brunswick. Yeah, potato. You mostly in the potato belt, but it, it is it is happening. Uh, down my way, not so much. Hmm. We're uh, not considered a heavy agricultural region in Kent County, although. Yeah. Although a hundred years ago we we used to be the potato belt. <laughs> yeah, fascinating shift, eh? And it yep. and it took that long for that to happen. Yep. And now I mean, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, ground that's uh, going into alders in Kent County. Well, there was there was I should say that uh, now there seems to be it seems to be getting back into production. There's a okay. there's a new uh, farmer that started last year uh, a couple years ago at uh, is now in the thousands of acres, but uh, that's land that's been neglected, that's been left behind. So he's got the, he's got to bring it back up, and that's that means lime. That means it's there's costs involved too, and then in those commodity crops, uh, if you're talking two or three dollars profit an acre, <laughs> yeah, makes it tough. It's a big deal. Um, maybe this is connected. Maybe not. Uh, the potash mine in Sussex. Mm-hmm. When that closed up, did that have an impact on local farming? It didn't seem to. In my, it didn't seem to affect the price of uh, a fertilizer too much. But I mean, further down the line, it certainly impacted impacted their local economy. Yes, yes, very much. Which in turn probably impact, impacted <coughs> local farmers that that were selling to these people. It's all yeah. it's all connected. Yeah, it is an election year, um, two thousand and eighteen. Um, does the alliance have uh, a script that they would, or a, a list? I mean, we saw the business community create their list a couple of weeks ago. Everybody comes up with their list. We want you to do this. We want you to do that. Do you have yep. something? Yes, some yes. Actually, uh, three years ago, we came up with. Uh, we did kind of a farm forum to figure out what what the biggest priority should be, and listed them down from. From how uh, how important they were to how less important, and uh, I mean, number one, of course, is a land a land use policies that, to protect the farmland that we already have. Uh, yes, it, it it takes about a thousand years to create a, a, an inch of topsoil, so try let's try to keep as much as of it as we can. So, what's the like, biggest risk to that right now, then? Well, it's around Moncton with topsoil stripping. It's a uh, it's a big issue. And then they sell that topsoil for for people's lawns and golf courses, oh. and so then that piece of land is basically gone from farming for forever. So I mean, it's uh, and there's only so much class two land, which is number one is the best, which is which most of it in Canada is under pavement in Toronto. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's a that's a story from my grade nine geography that yep. long ago. And so yeah, that's uh, that's gone now, but there, we still have class two in New Brunswick, which should be a no brainer. That should not, I mean, to, that should not be touched at all. That should be. So that sounds as sacred as when the environmental groups talk about woodlots. Because we, we have in our provincial narrative an understanding of how important it is to protect our woodlots and crown land and that debate that always comes up around access to crown land for pulp purposes mm -hmm. and forestry purposes. Similarly then, but not as well known, is your conversation about soil. Mm -hmm. And even the, even land planners want, want some kind of policy to guide them in making their decisions. So... It's 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 in the government's ears. They know they they uh, they know that they need to prepare a statement of provincial interest that would override any municipality. Or this is this is the guy. This is what you need. This is the narrative. This is what you need to follow. It supersedes anything else that would protect farmland. So did you draft up your version of that? There is there is a version that it's that is draft and it's actually it is good but unfortunately there's no enforcement capacity to it. There's it's just a piece of paper yeah. with a good plan and and nothing more. Okay. And is that on a website somewhere or is that on the links? It, it can, can it can be found, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well we'll put that in at the bottom of the copy in the show when we post the show up. Yeah. There's a space to put links. Okay. Uh, but unfortunately yeah it's got it has no teeth hmm. they can't do anything with it 
And there's also the farmland uh, identification program, which is a tax deferral. But right now we know of cases that farmland that's on flip, which this their taxes are deferred, are getting stripped for topsoil. So that's really should be illegal, but it's still they have no enforcement to stop it. So as you paint this picture, we have a need to have more farmers. We have a need to grow more of our own food. And at the same time, in another area, we're taking away the very foundation that makes that possible. Yeah, but I mean, but it does, it does work hand in hand. If you want, if more people means more, more growth for farmers to be able to sell more. So, you know, it's, it's not one or the other. It had it's working hand in hand to make sure it's done right. Yeah, it's a whole system. Yeah. It's all, it's all connected that way. Um, is New Brunswick a large enough population to support um, to support the farming, or will will always some farming have to export? Well, it depends. I mean, uh, we can only eat, there's a lot of potatoes in New Brunswick. We can only <laughs> eat so much potatoes. So I mean, there's yeah. going to be there has to be some export, but there's still a lot of potential. We uh, we're importing about eighty percent of our food now. So, I mean, well, how interesting! There was a push two, three weeks ago, and, and it's an ongoing one from different audiences about buy local, and and it never seems to hit. They're thinking kind of retail, more you know, it's chamber of commerce mindset. They never promote food <laughs> when they do that about buy local food and the impact that would have. Yep. No, and uh, the new campaign that's just come out too uh, for, for the love of New Brunswick. Yes. That's uh, I've just seen a little bit, and that that too will play definitely in. Because I mean, if if the industry is part, taking part in that, realize that they that they source locally too. I mean, it it will snowball, and it, it it's going to help everybody. A past interview with uh, Edouard Alain and Don Ontario was about CDC up at Centre Communautaire Saint, yep. Saint and yep. that was four or five years ago now. And that whole exercise of trying to source and buy local food. Well, that um, uh, actually is now that there's a new co-op that has been formed. Uh, it's very, still very young. I'd say it's still, still an infant. <laughs> I actually, uh, I'm actually on the board, and we have a meeting tomorrow. But it's they're up to, uh, they're up to seventy some schools now. Yes. So it's uh, there's still a lot of work to be done and a lot of kinks to be ironed out. But it's well underway. So. Hopefully, uh, it'll get some traction. And but like I said, it's changing mindsets takes a long time. Yes, because once the institutions start, you know, the large scale, the hospitals, the schools, government agencies. Well, that's where the government need really needs to take a, a leadership role and you know lead the kind of lead the charge in in starting that trend. Uh, they they. They say they won't do and all of this and that, but so far it's not it's not there yet. Yep. Uh, I know there's you know it's it's in steps. All of a sudden, it's, if we had to supply thirty percent tomorrow, probably we couldn't do it. But you know it's but but we certainly can do it. Yep. And that was well pointed out by Donna and Edouard in that conversation. Is they want to reach a certain percentage within a certain window of time. So it's not tomorrow. It's not that instant gratification because farmers need this lead time to know that that's coming. Yeah, well, like so, you mentioned before, it's it's a year, it's a yearly year cycle. Time, yeah. So uh, most people, most farmers have their their seed ordered for for next season already. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and so patience for that. Which then gets into an interesting piece that I always bring up with uh, political people when they're on the show, is that four-year election mindset for what we do compared to a 20-year or a 30-year challenge on where the solution comes from. So can we finally have a political narrative that doesn't mess around with decisions that are made? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The ultimate challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in your world, um, has that come to keep things stuck or is it or are there breakthroughs where governments actually let things be so that the 20 year cycle or a 40 year cycle could come somewhat to if usually i mean usually it's the deputy ministers and stuff that you know assistant deputy ministers that do a lot of the work as long as they're allowed from their minister to do it 
So as long as these people are kept in place and they can keep going with the project as they're going, you know, it should it should work itself out. But it's uh, if a government every time there's a new government they want to re restart everything to to say it's it's their idea to take the credit, you never go anywhere. Yeah. Because you're always restarting. Yeah, and that comes up a lot too with uh, the impact of studies. That the old studies, only two years ago, huh, are no longer good. We need to do our own study, and so everything just stays on the treadmill of doing studies, mm -hmm. and actions are hard to come by. Yeah, that uh, seems to happen. Yeah. So, so, do you? Does the alliance have a a connection or a, the ability to help guide government to better decision making? Well, I must say that. Uh, that our C our current CEO Jose is uh, certainly does have to does have the ear of government and we are and the people in the Department of Agriculture right now I I certainly hope that they don't change them because they really have agriculture to heart and if if they're allowed to take it forward I think that there's tremendous potential more I mean the the future for agriculture is looking way brighter now than it was 15 years ago. And I, I was still in the industry 15 years ago, and I, it was, it was the dark days. I mean, everybody was getting out. There was, there didn't seem to be any light at the end of the tunnel. But, I mean, it's, it's changing. People are starting to realize that local is important, and there's a whole dynamic there that you know they have to watch. And if they don't, something bad is probably going to happen down the line. Yeah. Um. Recently, the nurses' union uh, spoke to the attrition rate and the retiree potential in their industry. So something like 30 or 40 percent of nurses are in a position to retire at any given time. What's the government's strategy for the replacement of that? Your industry has the same challenge with the number of farmers that are now in their 60s looking for people to come in in their 20s and 30s. But it sounds like there's something in place to start to take the pressure off that transition with uh, the first entry program new, new entrant new roadmap entry. yep yeah. it's uh, it was first released last year in a paper form uh, now it's a pdf yeah but uh, it's going to go to a complete a whole website where you can yeah go and it'll be updated every year with if there's new information then you can find the information that you need without going through the whole booklet and so let's, with a mentorship program to join farmers and and new farmers that to, to learn from from the old one to you know okay. certain pitfalls maybe or how to maybe do certain things and so if someone's in their mid twenties or early thirties or at any time and they're thinking I think I'll be a farmer is that where they go to get started it, it's a really good start at least it'll give them an idea of you know that right. it's it mentioned that uh, you know it's not just about growing you need to you be you need to be able to sell it once it's ready and. You know, there's a whole checklist that you that you should go through. To, is this really for me or not? Yeah, so it's like the beginnings of the business plan, but specific yeah. for farming. Yeah. Um, does it also identify places to go to get to be taught uh, and to be mentored or an apprentice Men program? Mentored. Uh, it's more of a mentorship program. Uh, places to be thought, taught. Taught. Except for. Uh, for La Pocatière in Quebec or Guelph or uh, Dalhousie fac Faculty yeah. of Agriculture, those uh, would be the only places that uh, okay. I would be aware of right now. Uh, and does it also map out where there's some land available so they could get started? That is also coming, that okay. uh, there has been a survey sent out to, to collect all that data, yeah. and that will be part of that uh, new entrant roadmap. It will be a, a section just for that. So, uh, but they're still gathering information right now, so it should be. With all this new technology, one day there'll probably be an app. That you can oh, yes. Go top, 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 <laughs> and it's like, oh, look, there's like 200 acres up here or 50 acres. Yep, there. I mean, uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, old farmers, uh, if it's not in the family, sometimes they, they're kind of resistant to, you know, and sometimes they, it just happens, it just, then it just dies and it doesn't go anywhere. So yeah. there has to be that open. That open-mindedness that there's a bigger there's yeah. a bigger picture yeah and there's so many stories about younger people i'm thinking 35 or under trying to find a foothold in, in an economy where um artificial intelligence is eliminating jobs by the thousands i'm thinking of the food service industry they're forecasting you know 
thousands and thousands of jobs to be gone in the next three to five years. There was a story about driving uh, driverless cars, self-driving vehicles. We'll put two million people unemployed in the United States in the next five or six, seven years. Um, so here's farming and we need to eat <laughs> and a potential to, to give somebody a purpose and a contribution. And this is powerful. Yep. No, I... I I remember when I was in college twenty years ago. I was saying people that you know, if, if, whoever can make it through these dark days, the the future the future will be bright because people will always have to eat, yep. no matter what. People, you don't need to buy a new car. You don't need to have the biggest house, but you need to eat three times a day. Yep. And I mean, when when people start getting hungry, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, the dynamic will change pretty quick. Yeah, and, and also the awareness that, you know, the food in the grocery stores um, from research, there's roughly three to four days worth in the supply chain. It's constantly being refreshed every three to four days. So if something disastrous happened, then, then you're stuck. <laughs> Within yes. a week, you're stuck. And quicker than people realize. It can happen quicker than people realize. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So there's a, a thoughtfulness that goes to becoming a farmer and nurturing the farming system in the province. It's more than just, um, or oh, it feels good, or it'll help well, the just, local economy by 2%. And, there was a know. whole generation that, I mean, if you you'd, if you couldn't do anything else, you'd be a farmer, because it wasn't considered a, you know, yeah. a worthy profession, or, you know, like I said, the, even farmers themselves would encourage their, their kids to do something else, because it wasn't considered a you know, yeah. easy lifestyle. Yeah, but something got lost in that. Something got so. definitely lost because yeah. uh, it's. I mean, if you can say you feed people, to me, it's it's pretty important. It's pretty important. <laughs> um, totally different direction, maybe. Um, hot houses, large scale hot houses. I remember reading a story once out of Quebec, where they had uh, they had average soil and an average kind of space, but they built huge areas of hot houses to grow specific for export. I always wondered, is there potential for that in New Brunswick? There is potential, but there's also, a, it's a huge infrastructure cost. Okay. So depending on, and you can, uh, you might, I have to say that the government of Quebec uh, supports its farmers. Yes, well, that's part of their narrative, you know. Yeah. Farming is part of the Quebec narrative. And that's why I was tweaking a bit the English and French thing, because um, francophones are more, in, to me anyway, they're more in tune with that is ingrained in their culture and their identity. Well, that's more Quebec culture than necessarily Francophone culture. Okay. I uh, yeah, because I mean, there's there's a lot of English farmers in Quebec too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if good you point. Go into eastern townships and stuff, there yeah. there is quite a few. There's probably more English farmers yes. in Quebec than there is total farmers in New Brunswick. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Good, but that's a good point to make, though, because it's ingrained in the narrative of the in the fabric of the province. Well, I mean, it's they realize that if I guess maybe if they ever decide to separate, that they need to be able to feed themselves. <laughs> <laughs> maybe could be. Yeah. Uh, Kidding, you know, like <laughs> no. But those theoretical questions pose practical answers, and the province of Quebec addressed those some years back in the seventies. Mm -hmm. They made a pretty good adjustment of focus, and it uh, and it makes it a little hard for us to compete because they uh, through their insurance through their crop insurance, whatever they ship out of the province hmm. they are guaranteed their cost of production hmm. so they can they can ship product in new brunswick way cheaper than they can produce it but the government will make sure that they get their cost of production so that gets into those interprovincial trade barriers and, how and discussions you, and how do you level that playing yeah, field because we we can't there's no way we can do anything with like we can compete with that the only way is to make sure that the population understands that it's important for them to support to buy New Brunswick mm -hmm. because it's it's good for our economy, which is good for them down the line. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Does that get into? Um, does a new strategy need to emerge with these trade barrier discussions? And media focused on the, the guy bringing a lot of beer over the border from from Quebec, and that became the the flashpoint for a bigger conversation about interprovincial trade barriers. But it impacts food a lot more than, than you know, beer, for example. What you just described. There are some who would advocate to take down all barriers 
and just have open trade between the provinces. Well, it is that way for food. Okay. There's no there's no barriers for for interprovincial foods. But you just described how Quebec makes sure that their farmers. Yeah, but I mean that's that's their they're allowed to do it. It's their it's a provincial program. There there's no there's no laws or anything that can prevent that to happen. But so then the playing field isn't level though. No, no, no. So how and do we? I'm, and I'm not sure how. I'm well, actually I'm not sure that legally that they're even able to do anything about it. Okay. And it, 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 it's, it's been going on for twenty years. Okay. And. Yep. Yeah, where? How do you get to it? Oh, well, that, that's a nice piece of information to throw into this conversation. This might not be as simple as it, it appears on the <laughs> No, surface. no, that's, in my, it, for me, the, the best way is with the egg in the classroom and starting to change that mindset that people, if you speak, because they do it, they have it in Quebec. People in Quebec will make sure that they buy product from Quebec. They have that mindset. Mm -hmm. They have it. And that's, you know, they, they, they've done a good job. They're probably the model for Canada, of how they take care of agriculture and that whole, you know, that whole mindset of how they're, how they're doing it. And yep. people, you know, pe people go to the farmer's markets in Quebec. They, yeah. they support their farmers. Yeah, part of their provincial identity. It's, uh, if you go to uh, Ile d'Orléans, which is where a lot of the vegetables grow, you can hardly get on the, you can hardly get on the island in weekends from people <laughs> going to, to visit farms. Yep. It's bumper to bumper. Yeah, fascinating. They, they have the population, of course, but yep. I mean... But that's why I was wondering earlier about how many farmers do we need in full production in order to feed 750, 760,000 people, assuming everyone bought everything local. Well, 750 people still, 750,000 people still eat a lot. <laughs> yes, exactly. And yeah. the numbers show that we, we are importing a lot of food already. Yep. So if you start changing that mindset, I mean, it's there's potential there. Yep. I mean, and now you... I we sell just about everything locally right now, with that just with already with that number. So I mean, if people start buying more, there's potential for more people. I really don't want to get any bigger. So. Yeah, yeah, but that means the capacity would grow when more farmers come and start yep. to join because they, they see a future in it, and they could actually make a living out of it. Not because yeah. it's not because if you're a farmer that has to work an off farm job. To make your job profitable, your farm profitable, that yeah. means your farm is a pastime. Yep. Because you're doing something else to be able to do it. So if you're, if you're not making the profit, it's a pastime. Yep. yep. And it's a pretty big pastime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a pretty significant one that requires significant investment. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you can't, you can't buy a new tractor now for under a hundred grand. <laughs> yep. How would you like to close this out? Uh, well, I mean, uh, I uh, for me, I see the future being positive, I, more than negative. Uh, the mindset of people is changing. Uh, just from from my experience being at the farmers market and stuff, people, I have people telling me every year, "We're so lucky that you're so lucky to have you that you do this." So that you know, so yeah. the future is bright. I think it's just a matter of riding through that, riding through the hard <laughs> times and seeing the light at the end of the tunnel it's uh it's not going to be easy and it's 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 there's a lot of issues to deal with and it's as long as the conversation can get can happen through all the people that are involved and we're all looking to better everybody else i think i think we'll be all right but uh, and everybody has to do ha everybody has to do well for everybody to do well <laughs> Because if somebody falls, it it's gonna hurt you in the end too. So, it's uh yeah, it's. I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> no, that's a great answer. Thank you so much. Oh, no, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. And thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to dennisatchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Mm -hmm.